Hello, today I'd like to talk about Charles Dickens again, uh, about his first novel, The Posthumous Papers of uh, Pickwick, although it's now just called The Pickwick Club, well, Pickwick Papers, but actually it is The Posthumous Papers of the Pickwick Club. Yeah, this is uh, a typical device of uh, Victorian writers wanting to clearly state from the beginning that they are recounting a story that is told in the past. So, yes, he deliberately makes sure we understand that this is set a few years before it is written. Um, it was published in serial form in 1836. The background of the novel is fascinating, and although um, it's not always popular to talk about biography in terms of... Um, English literature, postmodernism, the rest of it decided that apparently it's just a text we ought to look at. Um, classic example of that, of course, is uh, Samuel Beckett, who refused to say, tell us anything that's useful about it, largely incomprehensible plays and novels, which suggests a lot um, and leave you scratching your head generally. So I'm going to talk about this. This was Charles Dickens's first big break. Um, is a man in his 20s, 24 I believe. Um, you have to know a little bit about his history to understand this book. So uh, when he was very young, uh, his father was doing well, they were middle class, uh, Charles was getting a good education, and then his father got into debt uh, and had to go to a debtor's prison, um, and then life obviously became horrible for Charles Dickens um, and his family. So the family stayed with, visited the father uh, who couldn't leave the prison for many years. Um, Dickens started off uh, copywriting, I think, for in the legal profession. He picks up information throughout all his earlier jobs, which is later revealed in his books. Um, and then he gets a job uh, as a correspondent for Parliament, I believe. Um, so he's starting to make his living from the pen. Um, and he just f finished a few issues of something called Sketches of Boz, or Full Boz, I haven't read it, um, presumably something to do with Parliament. Um, and then this opportunity was offered to him, Chapman and Hill, I think. Uh, they had quite a famous uh, illustrator on their books, uh, Seymour, somebody Seymour, Richard Seymour, I think. Um, who fancied uh, doing a series of illustrations about uh, yeah, Cockneys making mistakes while playing uh, sports. Something humorous. Uh, and the original proposal was that Charles Dickens uh, was going to add some prose connected to these uh, plates. Not to so much a story, but sort of tableau or something like that was popular at the time. Um, so yes, of course, Charles Dickens, desperate for recognition uh, and for the chance to make his living from writing, jumped at it. Um, and then quite quickly, Charles Dickens started saying, I don't think that I can just do this tableau nonsense that, uh, yes, we'll have the, the pictures, but I want to be, I want to have a proper story uh, and I want the, the pictures to reflect my story rather than my words reflect the pictures um, and they must have shown he must have shown them what he was writing and they were impressed enough to say yes carry on Charles don't worry about it <laughs> we agree with you um, and naturally you know it was, it's released in serial form and from the very beginning Charles Dickens is on the top of his form it's sparkling wit brilliant prose just captivating he sets up this wonderful imaginary world of the, of the Pickwick Club um, and it was a bestseller you know just just so many issues were sold and giving people the weekly new installment of um, Pickwick and his chums doing preposterous things um, so you know all the time while he was writing this Charles Dickens was getting more and more sure of his position as the writer um, and his popularity and of course it must occur to a writer that when they start getting popular that they can start to write about what they really are concerned about uh, and what 
really what really heckles them and uh, what they think need addressed and you can see this yet yeah. so you know and obviously culminates in uh, Dickens um, confronting probably of something that he wanted to talk about very much which was the absurdity of people going to prison for not paying their debts and thus denying them of um, the means of repaying their debts by getting a job because they're in prison <laughs> lots of things didn't make a lot of sense in those days um, so he does it and obviously I'm going to talk about that later um, it's marvellous Charles Dickens gets away with shooting his satiric arrows um, at all these things that he didn't like um, the medical profession the law profession which he knew something about uh, uh, politicians that he knew something about uh, pomposity um, and these things he was able to really let fly but within a comedic uh, format so let's begin so we've got as I said the posthumous papers uh, of, the, of the Pickwick Club uh, and we we're presented with Pickwick who's uh, older than the others it seems uh, corpulent uh, not too clever a, a, a mediocre brain uh, <clears throat> who's taken it upon himself as a retired businessman to uh, indulge his fantasies of uh, being useful to society by furthering um, the boundaries of science uh, and then you've got Augustus Snodgrass who is supposedly a poet but never produces uh, a single line of verse to show us his abilities uh, and you've got Nathaniel Winkle, uh, who's younger, with Snodgrass is also younger than Pickwick, who's supposedly the sporting man. Uh, <laughs> he's absolutely <laughs> inept in all physical <laughs> activity. He um, manages to get shot, uh, to lose a horse, um, just, just riotously incapable. Uh, and then we've got Tupman, who is think is uh, slightly older than Snodgrass and Winkle, and corpulent, uh, and fancies himself as a ladies' man. And here we have uh, an example of Dickens playing with the names of characters, like he does a lot. Uh, Tup is a very old word to um, get to, to do the business, as it were. Um, so today it would be something like Shagman, um, and yes, he's an hilarious character because he's clearly not attractive to the ladies and he thinks he's a, a lady killer um, and his big mm, section of the novel where he tries to be a lady killer um, he in this case is a sense of uh, trying to elope with uh, Miss Wardle the sister of Mr Wardle <coughs> it all goes terribly wrong and Alfred Jingle steals a march on him uh, and doesn't achieve this with any great success so at the start of the novel it's just it's it's a brilliant world that dickens creates of just a consequence free one pre-lapsarian world where you know rich folk uh they have their little club <coughs> where they're imagining they're doing wonderful things and they decide to go out abroad leave london uh and take an interest of take a note of interesting things and um and then report back this really means catching a coach down the road to an inn uh getting plastered they get basically they're just drinking all the time <laughs> it's quite noticeable that their this abstemiousness is not a thing in this novel when they sit down for food they sit down for a lot of booze uh and they don't generally get up too much afterwards uh, so it's not a very uh, rigorous scientific pursuit uh, that they're undertaking um, and this is the, all the humorous scrapes they get into this is what makes the book love so much um, people seem to love the fact that you know here's Dickens at his lightest just um, giving us farce and, and almost virtually slapstick of course that's got to be partly suggested by the illustrations that Dickens thought uh, were going to be important to the book as it happens the illustrator did so many illustrations uh, and then committed suicide so it was, the job was taken up by Viz and Viz 
continued to be Dickens illustrator for I think all of his career so in the beginning I thought I'd just I'd get around to actually reading something from the book since I didn't manage in the last one um, yes Charles Dickens is taking a piss it's just it's just brilliant so he talks about uh, the gigantic brain of Pickwick uh, and then he goes there sat the man who were traced to their source the mighty ponds of Hampstead and agitated the scientific world with his theory of tittlebats. You see, this is the mock heroic. Dickens is continuously taking the piss out of uh, Pickwick um, in the first part of this book. You know, everything is compared to, you know, uh, like, like the Greeks. Uh, freeing Helen from Troy or you know it's just they're, they're all such massive achievements and, and they're giants of men and they're doing work that is just so important you know uh, Dickens is, is ruthless in in his uh, in his text just deflating uh, putting the pin in to Pickwick see so we've got comedic comedic distance already so we can laugh at their misfortunes because we don't sympathise with it too much. We see them as just uh, yeah, drunken fools. So, what do they do? Uh, <laughs> the first thing they do is, yeah, they go down. So they get on a, <laughs> even before they leave London, they're just showing themselves to be inept. Um, Pickwick starts talking to a, a coachman um, about the age of his horses uh, and starts writing down details and the coachman gets a bit weirded out by all of this and uh, a scuffle ensues outside the post house and Alfred Jingle uh, is introduced into the story in, with his, his bizarre speech uh, and seems to save them. They all go to the countryside, jolly fine time, get completely pissed. Uh, they're all basically worse for wear apart from uh, Tupman uh, who is reinvigorated uh, by finding out that there's a, a ball going on uh, in the pub where they're staying and by Alfred Jingle <clears throat> who we should suspect from the start of being a bit of a con man uh, because he says I haven't got any, any luggage, um, I haven't got any money and I'd love to come to this ball with you Tupman but you'll have to provide me with, with both. So Tupman <sighs> you know being the great lover obviously subs Alfred Jingle uh, and nicks Nathaniel Winkle's coat uh, and then obviously Alfred Jingle they, uh, and Tupman go to the ball uh, Alfred Jingle doesn't really play by the rules he goes straight for the ladies he insults somebody in the army uh, and the following morning <laughs> there's the second comes down uh, and challenges uh, Winkle to a duel this is just yes it's just brilliant comedy when um Pickwick advises Winkle to, you know, be a man. Um, uh, th th all these are allegations are false, and you can't apologise for something you didn't do. And I'll happily be your second. And Wink Nathaniel Winkle's going, yes, I think that's right. And you, you please, whatever you do, don't call the law or the police and get them to stop me being murdered very shortly. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like. <laughs> It's very amusing and it comes out brilliantly in a movie. Uh, in you know, the two movies, I saw the 1952 movie the other day, uh, which is very amusing. So they come to the moment of having the duel and then the, the so-called wrong party discovers that Mr. Winkle isn't the man that uh, insulted his honor um, <laughs> and so doesn't decide to kill him. Uh, <laughs> and they did, but they do discover it's Alfred Jingle and he's kind of pushed out but soon to reappear uh, and then they they join a battle reenactment or something like that and they happen to bump into uh, Mr Wardle who's in his coach with his very fat uh, servant on the roof just getting hammered on booze and uh, he, he recognises his fellow gentleman and says hop in my coach and we'll all get pissed together and, and they do and then he invites I think it's a jolly fine people uh, invites them to his, his country home called Dingle Dale uh, in order just to get pissed for a few more days 
So, yes, comedy ensues in trying to get to uh, Dingley Dell. It turns out that, um, you know, there's nobody that can drive them. They have to hire a coach themselves, and they're just completely inept. There's the shades of uh, with Null and I in this, you know, just the, these city folk being completely out of their depths in the in the country uh, and just objects of derision. So they get to Dingley Dell, lots of drinking ensues, and Tuckman uh, re reverts to character, and, uh, yes, he starts courting um, the owner's sister who's a widow um, uh, and then yes Nathaniel Winkle and Snodgrass become um, interested in the two daughters uh, of Mr Wardle um, and this all yes we have it's, it's like PG Roadhouse it's this you know these uh, little uh, plots and subplots going on where one person outdoes another so uh, Alfred Jingle uh, has paid the fat servant I don't, man servant I don't know what it is it's a young boy to kind of spy on what Tupman is doing and, just, um, and then he's using this information uh, pretends to be the good man advising Tupman what to do in his courtship but really uh, yeah, with borrowing £10 from him and, and planning his elopement uh, with Miss Wardle who has uh, obviously there's always money involved who has an allowance a month a yearly allowance which would allow Mr Jingle to go from being a strolling actor vagabond pauper you know con man to having some permanent means uh, at his disposal um, it, it works out for Jingle he manages to elope using the £10 that Tuckman gave him uh, and first time we see um Pickwick slightly rise above, you know, just the comic character. He's the one that decides he's going to go off in the middle of the night with Mr. Wardle to rescue um, his niece, um, his sister, sorry, his sister. And yeah, obviously Snowglass and, and Winkle, they're just kind of useless to see, but Pickwick actually steps up at this moment. Uh, a big chase ensues, uh, they find the couple and they have to pay uh, jingle off you see it's this it's this idea of it's it's all fun like no consequences um you know things happen but they live in this gentlemanly sphere sphere where you know money uh position will just guarantee their safety uh and security they can carry on just bimbling around the country pretending to be geniuses when they're obviously very mediocre uh, at everything and this is how the novel can continue to you know um strikes me uh the pg roadhouse must have studied this book inside and out uh because what we have from it uh you know we have pickwick uh, and his faithful manservant sam weller uh, and then pg roadhouse came up with a bertie and wooster he kind of changed it a little bit so pickwick became more of the young rich fool uh was uh, Pickwick's not a fool he just overestimates his um, mental acuity really uh, and his academic credentials uh, and then you've got Sam Weller who's very resourceful uh, and helps his master out of scrapes uh, and he's sort of slightly he's made more posh uh, in the character of uh, Jeeves the butler um, but you can essentially see how this the same world is recreated where it's just you know, rich silly people just uh, having love affairs and you know games of croquet and just divorce from reality there's never any talk of work <laughs> in PG in Wodehouse and there's never any talk of work at the start of um, Pickwick Papers he's, he's kind of clear the world that Dickens lived in that if you actually have a job you were poor. <laughs> the rich, God, no, they never did anything. They had, they had allowances or they had land or property just to allow them to pursue their own fanciful, uh, you know, daydreams and, and just enjoy their life. Um, although there's a slight nuance here in Pickwick Papers. It's kind of hard to pick up at first, but Pickwick is a retired businessman, so he's not actually an aristocrat. Uh, and near the end of the book, we discovered that uh, I think Winkle, Nathaniel Winkle's father uh, is an industrialist from Birmingham. My God, Birmingham gets a mention. Uh, and they have to go there at the end of the, 
Pickwick goes out there at the end of the novel to try and get the father to agree to Snodgrass's uh, marriage um, after eloping. So, you know, they're not born to the aristocracy, but this seems to be the, the new middle class, which Dickens isn't really highlighting very much. But yes, they're not born rich, but they've done well in their life. And obviously Snodgrass uh, and Winkle, probably it's their fathers that have done well that allow them to have the you know, education of a gentleman where you might know about the classics, but you'll never know anything about hard work or <laughs> these kind of things. So, yes, just just brilliant comedy. Um, and then, yeah, it's kind of shocking what happens from Dickens continually taking the piss out of Pickwick to him getting something of a victim caught up by circumstances. You've got this um, funny situation of Pickwick trying to explain to his um, landlady uh, that he's thinking of taking on another, which is meant to be meant to be Sam Weller, but uh, Mrs. Bardell thinks he's actually in a roundabout way proposing marriage and yeah, we see this lots in, in stories of special comedy, uh, you know, it's just the misunderstanding, comic misunderstanding, um, dramatic irony, we know what he's really talking about but she doesn't uh, and <laughs> then of course his friends walk in and she's fainting and in his arms and it's all looking quite bad. Uh, she's persuaded by uh, lawyers Dodson and Fogg to uh, sue Pickwick for a breach of Paris mm, promise of marriage. Pickwick thinks it's ridiculous and ludicrous um, and, and intends to fight it but it, it's all quite quite damning really you know he, his friends saw uh, her in his arms and this is Dickens day where they didn't have uh, yeah their malls are very different to ours and uh, yeah, it's obviously hypocritical Victorian society where you know just holding a woman is tantamount to having sex with her apparently um, and yes they all pretend to be very above board but at the same time you know they love courting and um, I guess chasing women so uh, yes so the lawyers offer Pickwick uh, the fee of £1,500 to make this disappear Pickwick takes a principled position and says no I'm not paying you anything you are you know you're you're clearly con artists. You're, uh, you're predators. You're, you're, you're preying on people, and you're awful. And this is Dickens getting the boot in quite early uh, with his satire. Um, yeah, and they do come across, you know, just, uh, melodramatic but evil characters, horrible slime, uh, Dodson and Fogg, and so it doesn't. The consequences aren't immediately apparent because. Uh, it's two months before they can put him in debtor's prison for refusing to um, settle up. Well, they go to court, and of course he loses, um, Pickwick loses. Again, this, I think, says a lot about Victorian society and, and their notions of marriage and the relations between men and women. Um, but he doesn't go to prison immediately. He's got a, a couple of months to just basically have some more jollies with his friends, or, and this is all to do with their amorous pursuits, of course. Um, Mr. Bit, of course. Uh, there's, there's one section where he goes to Eaton's will um, uh, to cover uh, a political race, um, and that's just brilliant. D Dickens doesn't side with either side. You know, he's not uh, Tories or Whigs or anything like that. It's just like, like Reds against the Blues, really, or something. You know, you got two sides that hate each other and accuse each other of terrible things, but there's no, there's never any substantive notion of policies of what they're going to help what they're going to do to help uh, either the common man or society in general or make England greater, it doesn't really talk about that uh, and it's all driven by uh, newspaper editors, yeah, so how present is Dickens to realise the connection between politics uh, and the media, it's the, the media that has so much power in uh, raising support for politicians uh, in promoting gatherings uh, and in spouting incendiary nonsense to uh, <clears throat> rile their supporters uh, into almost, uh, you know, into almost violence against a, a pathological hatred towards the other side. Um, uh, then we get treated to uh, 
uh, explanations of how one side will win by making the other side drunk so they all fall over and miss the polling time or give them free coaches to the wrong area just these, these, these cunning little tricks um, and this is a brilliant little aside that um, Dickens shows us the farcical nature uh, of politics at the time but yes the day of reckoning comes for Samuel Pickwick uh, and it's a little bit of a surprise when I read this book the first time I go bloody hell wow this is dark this is really dark this just breaks with the tone of the novel altogether um, yeah he's he's met at the door and escorted out he's taken to a halfway house first of all where they're all sort of drinking and gambling um, it's better conditions than the prison but uh, Pickwick sees it for what it is it's, it's just it's just ridiculous um, I'm not going to spend my time here just take me to the real prison um, so they do and then he says no I haven't got any money for you you know just don't treat me any better than anybody else so um, he gets put up for the night in the in the common room um, and then is kind of slowly persuaded to perhaps spend a bit of money in buying uh, a room in, in the fleet prison Sam Weller uh, who yes not so long before he would employed as his uh, valet his servant um, gets his father to lend him money uh, and deliberately not pay back the money and so he'd have to go to debtors prison as well you know this is a, a massive ask <laughs> for any servant uh, and he displays yeah, profound loyalty and it's quite moving and suddenly yes we're living in a different world this is a world of consequences this is where <laughs> bad things happen and it's very clear that the mock heroic tone that Dickens used at every opportunity to deride Pickwick is suddenly not used anymore Pickwick becomes a man of of some stature and nobility he becomes withdrawn and um, reflective and he finds uh, Alfred Jingle in the same prison for not paying debts uh, and he takes pity on him gives him money um, in order for him to lead you know half bearable life in the prison uh, he keeps himself to himself as something quite serious about it and then obviously Sam moves into the prison with him to make his life a little bit easier and yeah I was just really touched by this and if you obviously aware of Dickens's life then this is him at the at first opportunity his first book to say this is awful you know this is the reality this is what you make some people suffer for these stupid laws and the only people who benefit are the lawyers who collect damages yeah yeah <laughs> you know disgusting and so that's Pickwick and he think he's buggered is his principles because he has them it seems like he has the money he's not like super rich but he looks like he has the money to get himself out of prison but out of principle out of principle and doesn't principle rears his ugly head at this point stops him from doing so uh, and then we see his humanity come through uh, as things begin to unfold and the wider landscape so mrs bardell the the woman who accused him of breach of promise she too can't pay her lawyer's fees because dickens didn't pay i'm uh, not dickens i mean pickwick didn't pay so she gets to debt she goes to debtors prison uh and now we see something clear from pickwick's character that was hinted at before but really comes to the fore now and that's his decorous nature he's very chivalrous you know there's a thing about women he would never want to do something awful to a woman or make a woman suffer like this he might say it's sexist but this is kind of his makeup he doesn't have any you know great sexual thoughts uh he's he's not <laughs> it's one of the funniest bits is when he's caught in a cupboard trying to uh, in a girls school <laughs> it's just ridiculous uh and he's trying to do the right thing to protect women but he comes across as a, a sexual pest he's kind of misunderstood but in prison we see this very clearly that no i can't let this woman suffer on my behalf on on for my supposed principles and he's, he's having to recalibrate uh his his morality around the fact that this takes precedence so he decides to yes to mm, pay his damages so that goes down to 750 pounds so he he did save 
save quite a lot of money by being in prison for a while uh, and by doing that then Mrs Bardell would be let off the hook and he also very kindly pays the debts of Alfred Jingle who's their comedic nemesis um, uh, it's, it's, you know it's just brilliant on Pickwick's paper part to say well that's just that's just irrelevant and pointless you know um i would just want to help you as, as it's a humanitarian and kind christian thing to do um yes so they get out of prison and that's clearly where the novel should stop shouldn't it you know we should stop with pickwick being elevated they've come out of this 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 Eden of Wodehouse nonsense and reality is struck. He goes to prison. Uh, he has to rethink his values, and he comes out uh, a more a serious and considered person uh, and an actual help to society. That would have been a brilliantly rounded book, but it's not the comedic structure. And obviously, Dickens had a massive hit on his hands. You know, this is the Game of Thrones of its day. He wasn't going to stop. So. The story continues. In my opinion, it's wrong. That that should have been where it finished, and it would have been a um, Dickens masterpiece. Might have taken Dickens a little bit longer to become famous doing that, um, but he didn't. He it goes on. So there's more hijinks with Nathaniel Winkle um, uh, trying to. He meets Arabella, mm, Arabella Allen, uh, at a party at Dingley Dell. Uh, they fall in love. They have to elope. Uh, well, they have to rescue her from her brother, who is a, a medic with uh, another bloke, and they just get pissed all the time. You know, they've graduated from medical school, but they're just they're just comment like they're they're on the same level as Angle, uh, Alfred Jingle. They just 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 take the piss, and they do literally uh, all they do is consume booze, and it's almost a competition for how drunk they can get and how quickly. Um, more comedy on um, Dickens's part. But yes, so we have all of these things, that, and it's not interesting. Nineteen fifties book um, film. I'm sorry, this this is covered in about two minutes. Basically, you know, the filmmaker thought this was ludicrous and ridiculous, well, and wanted to end it as soon as possible. But it goes on for a few hundred extra pages, this and that, and then we have the comedic structure of yes. Uh, so despite the father being in uh, opposed to the marriage, he eventually comes round uh, and Winkle. Uh, Nathaniel Winkle can get married and Snodgrass uh, can also get married so you know in typical just like Shakespearean comedy you have to have weddings uh, marriages at the end it's union it's harmony uh, we've got obviously Alfred Jingle who's shuffled off to the West Indies but he's forgiven he's brought he's brought into the fold uh, as it were so it fulfills the needs of the genre the ending and all this stuff subsequent to the prison scenes um, but from my point of view and I think from an artistic point of view it's just a little bit ridiculous however this is a book you never want to st never want to stop because it's just it's just hilarious <laughs> it's just hilarious um, so other comments uh, GK Chesterton Chesterton wrote um, an essay about it, it was quite interesting um, so he sees it as you know, a brilliant novel. Uh, but one of the things that he likes about it is that this is, he says this claims that this is the only novel where Dickens doesn't let grief in. Or it's there, but it's contained. He lets humour out, but he keeps grief in. Uh, and it's, that's kind of a fair point, because in the later works we see Dickens... Yeah, he's been accused of being mawkish and sentimental and I remember Paul and Dobson and Son he just takes he takes pages and pages to die and uh, yes the grief is just very clear um, uh, for some reasons it's brilliant for other readers it, it's very hard work and uh, painful and just, so the only kind of point of grief that Jesterson points out is when Sam Weller's father his latest spouse, another widow. He goes through lots of widows. This is one of the jokes about Sam Weller's dad. He's, he's just a, he's a magnet for widows, it seems. And he just sees a portly, hairy, gruff, middle-aged, uh, working-class man who just gets pissed all the time. What his attractions are to the female sex is just beyond everybody. But <laughs> there you have it. Um, 
What was I talking about? <laughs> Oh, yes, G.K. Chesterton. So he thought that that was brilliant that Dickens didn't go in to the dark side, into the grief uh, at all. And he, you know, he eulogises Sam Weller as being the everyday Englishman who's got this sort of genius humour. Um, that sort of, It's a bit patriotic and it's a bit rubbish comment by Chesterton. But, uh, you know, he is right that... There's, there's no sentimentality or mawkishness. There's no slow deaths in this. Um, it's a proper comedy. It's, it's the most comedic of all of Dickens's books. Um, and, of course, he's kind of right about the genius that is Sam Weller. He's very amusing. Uh, and when he comes into the book, it, it changes the dynamics. It, it's kind of like starts off as a buddy novel. It's uh, Pickwick and his chums just having a laugh in the countryside. Uh, and then it becomes Pickwick and his chums and Sam Weller, and those two become closer and closer, especially if Pickwick's life takes a drastic turn for the worst. Uh, and then, it, you know, we've got the loyalty of this man is uh, outstanding, and his resourcefulness and the rest of it. He's, you know, idealised Cockney? I don't know what it is, but it's all forgiven because he comes up with some very... He, he well, comes up with his own form of speech, which is just... just de Dickens and his genius, he characterises often very clearly through um, the way his characters talk rather than just describing what they are. And he's got this infuriating habit, from my point of view, of every W uh, he turns into a V sound, and every V sound v, he turns into a W sound, just like his old man. And uh, reading it for the first time, I was just, I was almost checking for myself, does he really do this every time? Uh, yes, and he, yes, it is, it's almost on the spot. And you think with the, the mental power the, to be able to uh, do this spontaneously is quite a, something in itself. Uh, and then, yes, so Sam Weller, he spawned uh, lots of spin offs, uh, you know, Sam Weller proverbs and Sam Wellerisms. It's when it's something that's aphoristic but uh, inappropriate. Uh, there's nothing so refreshing as sleep, sir, as the servant girl said before she drank the egg cup of laudanum. That's one. If you wally my precious life, don't upset me, as the gentleman said to the driver when they were carrying him to Tyburn. There you go. Just two examples of... This is cheeky cockney wit. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's one of the highlights of the book, clearly. Along with Alfred Jingle, who's... Um, Yes, fascinating, you know, uh, Dickens hit upon this idea of just using kind of noun phrases with uh, truncated adjectives or just adverbs stuck on the end. Uh, very charming, uh, you know, so it's like uh, wonderful examples of femininity, very lovely, like this. It's like uh, uh, back in the day, uh, mm, lost horse, terrible condition, like this. He just, he speaks in notes, um, uh, some sort of pompous colonel or something. He's, he talks about the West Indies. And he just goes off into mad flights of fancy. Um, and it's all part of his con game. You know, he can say a lot very quickly because he's missing out a lot of words. Uh, and he completely, yes, he, he fools the people around him into just giving him free booze, free food, free board, free foot clothes. You know, he just gets everything from him. And he's just... just speaks in shorthand, he speaks in, you know, it's not like Yoda, it's not inverted as such, he's just missing out chunks of parts of speech, um, and this just, just defines him, and it's brilliant, And but at the same time, we have a characterisation where it looks like he does turn a leaf, a little bit surprising, uh, and he seems, he's got this, he's got his evil sidekick, you know, but this is a brilliant foil, isn't it, so you've got uh, Alfred Jingle uh, uh, with Job Worthy on one hand, the evil pair, and then you've got Sam uh, and Pipwick on the other hand as the, the the good pair. You know, you've got so yes, they reflect each other and the rest of it. But by the end, obviously, as I said, Jingle comes back into the fold, and he's given a ticket by Pipwick to go to the West Indies. Whether he really wants to go or not, who knows? <laughs> but there you go. So yes, the two characters with uh, yes the most linguistic peculiarities Sam Weller and Alfred Jingle uh, yes add to the yes to the genius of this book um, oh, well I was speaking for nearly 40 minutes about this book yeah I was it took me a while to get to this book because I thought oh, it's his first book it's not going to be brilliant but actually 
it is brilliant and I think a lot of people who aren't necessarily you know massive readers of Victorian literature or Dickens they read this book and they're disappointed by everything else but Dickens because it's it's just it's just pure fun for a lot of it you know it's the closest to an airport novel I think that Dickens ever ever wrote and it's treasured by the nation I'm sure it should bloody well should be um, yeah and yeah, if you want some fun in lockdown and you want to escape uh, the grimness of your one hour's walk a day or whatever and wondering if you're uh, going to make enough money to put food on the table over the coming weeks uh, then yeah I thoroughly recommend read the Pickwick Papers it only cost me £2.50 from a charity shop when it was open um, Yeah, you can find Dickens everywhere because Debbie reads it people die and they send them to charity shops and you can be picked up for um for a real bargain so take care everybody bye bye <laughs>